All right, so I have now used the Sony a7R5 for a little bit more than half a year, and I have taken more or less about 50,000 photos with this camera. Obviously, I have not finished all of those photos. In this video, I'm going to go into a few different things that I have learned from using this camera and how I like it here half a year later. If you want a more detailed review of the Sony a7R5, why I bought it and so forth, be sure to watch my first video on this camera. So here, more than half a year later, my biggest issue that comes with the Sony a7R5 is actually also one of its biggest features, and it's the 61 mega pixels. A 61 megapixel file, even in compressed RAW, takes up about 63 megabyte per file. That's a lot of file storage. Now, I can actually live with the file size. However, the problem is that Lightroom Camera RAW and the photo editing softwares are actually struggling with a 61 megapixel file, especially when you're using an Intel-based machine, computer machine, computer, <laughs> as I am. However, you're probably not having these issues if you're using one of the newer MacBooks with the M1 or M2 chips, because they are lightning fast for exactly this job. However, even with an i7 processor, 32 gigabytes of RAM and a 3070 DFX NVIDIA graphics card for laptops. My laptop is struggling with handling these files when I do layers in Lightroom or Camera Raw, and not to mention the new AI denoising. It takes 40 minutes, 40 minutes to clean up a single 61 megapixel file with my computer. And my computer is even decently new and good. So yes, I kind of do feel forced simply just to up my workflow to look into getting a MacBook Pro. Another issue with the 61 megapixel files is that I feel that I don't really get that much more image quality out of them. It has only been very, very few times where I've had to really crop in tight, where I may have benefited a little from it. However, as a landscape photographer, I usually do get the focal length right in the field anyway, so I'm really not benefiting that much from the 61 megapixels. And as you can see here in the background, this photo here is taken on my A7R 3 and it works perfectly fine as a massive print here in the background. So in the end, it is obviously always way more important what you put in front of your camera than how many pixels it is. So if you struggle with composition in landscape photography, be sure to get my two eBooks on exactly that topic. There are links to them down in the description of the video. They're super easy to read, loads of examples, and I even have examples from cameras with much lower megapixels like the Canon 5D Mark II, which is 21 megapixels, and a drone photo, which is yeah also about the 20 megapixels. Now, when it comes to video features and the a7R5, there are a lot of great improvements over the older cameras. Obviously, I can flip the screen out and see myself, which is very beneficial, and I really enjoy that they have moved the record bottom up here on top. However, and now it gets a little bit technical, for some reason, in Sony's infinite wisdom, they have decided that when you're choosing between the two different codecs that you shoot 4K in, the difference between the two codecs is more or less double or half the file size. So obviously, you want to shoot with a codec that delivers half the file size, but actually a little bit better image quality. That's the newer codec. However, they have limited that to either 60 frames a second or 24 frames a second, not 30 frames a second, which is a completely standard format, and that's the one I'm shooting with. So if I want to have the size of my files, I will have to shoot at 24 frames a second or at 60 frames a second. The only problem is that shooting at 60 frames a second, I double the amount of frames in the file. So that means I double the file size. So I don't win anything by shooting with the newer codec. So shooting with the older codec doubles my file size, but I can shoot at 30 frames a second. <sighs> Why? Why? So since I've got the a7R5, there are a few new L brackets on the market. This one here is my old one from Smallrig from the a7R3. It has done a magnificent job over the years, and it actually does fit 
my a7r5 camera however since the a7r5 came out there are also a lot of these new small things on the market so how they work is that you simply just attach them underneath your camera like this and once you have attached it you can simply just put on the lens on top then you can open up the little screw here on the side of course attach it to your tripod and then you can turn your camera into vertical position or into the horizontal position it's a great little feature it comes with some ups and downs so i have been using this for the past months and eh, my thoughts on it are a little bit mixed let me know down in the comments of this video if you want a review of this little thing this one here is called the atoll series from silent corner if you want to look into that yourself i may have a link down in the description of the video and if you enjoy this video so far i would highly appreciate a like and of course be sure to subscribe if you want to learn even more about landscape photography i talk about how i use my gear and i show how to get landscape photos in the field that's what i mainly do on this channel so hit the subscribe button and ring the little bell notification if you want notifications about when i upload a new video so the next big update that sony also introduced for the a7r5 was that the shutter closes down to protect the lens from dust coming in however dust is still coming in not as much and I would actually say that especially in more like wet environments this one here is a lifesaver it's really good now when I was in the Faroes back in March and we had these crazy winter conditions I had actually put this one in to not close down when I took off and changed the lenses to my big regret because at some point we had so much snow blowing around that a lot of snow actually came in onto my sensor well it's technically not the sensor there's a little bit of glass in front of the sensor so you don't get the sensor exposed to the weather but the glass actually got a lot of like snow dust on it and as you can see in these photos here they are just spotted everywhere now the interesting part was this has never happened to me before that the snow actually melted while i was photographing nothing has happened since but i'm pretty certain <laughs> that that may not be like the best thing to do to your camera but nevertheless i haven't had any issues with it having a little bit of all that particles ice particles onto the sensor and then they melt hopefully they just evaporate they haven't left any issues on it but yeah there we go so one thing i do find super annoying with this feature here is that you can only use it in the non-silent mode so when you actually use the mechanical shutter and the reason why that's a problem for me is that i shoot quite a lot around sunrise sunsets also but sunrise for the most part and with a closed down aperture i usually get shutter speeds between one tenth of a second and half a second so those semi long or slow shutter speeds and even if i'm on a tripod and with a delayed shutter like two seconds or five seconds the mechanical shutter will actually wobble the camera just enough so that I can actually get a little bit on sharp photos and that is especially visible at 61 megapixels so that is why I often shoot in silent mode simply just so I don't have that mechanical shutter release but I cannot use silent shooting in combination with the priority of having the shutter closed down when I shut off the camera it should be able to be fixed with firmware don't you think i have also yet to provoke that accessory not recognized error message that pops on on the back of the screen on sony cameras and it happens each time that the hot shoe gets wet and it happened all the time on my old a7r3 however here on my 5 I have yet to see it it may be because i'm a little bit more protective about it because i use this little protector on top of my hot shoe this one here is from nikon and simply just 
add it in and it does protect the hot shoe a little bit better wow this is hard <laughs> a little bit better than the ones that actually comes with the sony cameras so at the very least that's a good thing so i briefly mentioned the flippy floppy fully articulating screen here yeah, it is so good yes I use it. I don't use it as much as I actually thought I would, but that has mainly something to do with my shooting style changing a little bit, so I'm not making those like very low, dramatic, wide-angle foregrounds. It does happen from time to time. But when you need this go into vertical and you need to actually be able to see it from a low perspective, oh my, this is just like, yeah, it, it's good. It, <laughs> I, I enjoy it very much. And it's, of course, as mentioned, much easier to use it when I talk to the camera and I do my video. Another thing, can you believe it, I've also done for the first time in my life is to actually benefit from up here. You can see these custom bottoms here where you can code in what settings you want on those. And it's very simple. You simply just go into one of the other modes, manual, shutter speed priority, program mode, aperture priority, and so forth. You put in all the settings, all the deep settings also into the camera, everything from shutter speed, ISO, aperture, obviously dependent on your shooting mode, but also the deeper settings such as focus area, image stabilization, shooting mode, all those different things. And then you simply just go into the menu and save those settings onto one of these custom bottoms up here. And then when you change onto them, it remembers those settings. And even though you are in one of those bottoms, you can still change your settings. And when you then dial away, let's say go to manual and go back, then you get those settings back that you saved. Not the ones that you just used, but those that you actually saved. When it comes to pixel shift, no, I still do not use it. My computer struggles at 61 megapixel. It will definitely also struggle at 200 megapixels. Focus stacking, I definitely use that feature in this camera. It's fantastic. It's only when I really need it that I use it. If you want to learn how to put focus stacking together, be sure to enroll in my big Photoshop for Landscape Photographers post-processing course. Here I show three different ways, the manual way, the automatic way in Photoshop, and a third-party way that is probably the strongest, especially if you have like 10 focus stacked images that you need to put together. And I of course also show how to edit those photos from start to finish. There are many individual tutorials on that in my Photoshop course. And besides focus stacking, I also show how to focal length blend, how to use atmosphere and glow in your photos, how to edit with luminosity masks, and much, 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 much more. Be sure to benefit from the coupon code down in the description of the video if you want to save a little bit of money. Now I have of course pointed out a few negative things about the Sony a7R5. However, it's a massively great camera. And the best way to say it is that it gets the job done. That's the thing. That is why it's such a great camera. It gets the job done. If you want a more in-depth video about the a7R5, be sure to check out that video and generally just subscribe to the channel if you want to see me use the a7R5 in the field as a landscape photographer and maybe also soon a little bit of a wildlife photographer because I'm going to Svalbard soon. Check out the links down in the description of the video if you want to learn more about composition or you want to learn more about photo editing. Thanks for now. See you next time where it's going to be from Svalbard, probably.